Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Simon Rosenbaum. Uh, I've come across Simon first through my work as an academic, looking through the literature, um, impressive work in terms of you know, systematic reviews, uh, meta-analyses of around his field of expertise, but also clinical trials, working with people, you know, and, and doing amazing work. Uh, he is a champion, he's an equally world champion. What that means is he champions the cause of equal wealth in the community and he also brings down and, uh, in his sphere of influence, in, in, his, in his constellation that he has uh, a head, and that's broad. He's a director of the Exercise Science, Exercise Sports Science Australia um, and he's really a champion in so many ways, he's done so much and he's only two years out of high school. So let's all <laughs> Skip over that, but 
basically we know the stats, we know that there's a higher risk of sort of preventable, premature cardiovascular disease. And of course in the general population we know that we can prevent that. And so we know that unfortunately people living with mental illness are not experiencing the same benefits and even advancements in treatment and prevention that the general population is. So we know about an 80 percent, sorry, an 80 percent higher risk of, of cardiovascular disease um, and unfortunately a, a much higher risk of death due to these conditions. So where this work started was looking at can exercise improve the physical health of people living with mental illness and the answer is absolutely yes, no different to the general population. And then what I think we looked at was the idea about the mental health benefits of exercise and there's a lot of work around exercise and depression and increasingly we're seeing the effect of exercise on other conditions such as schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, it doesn't really matter. And one way that I like to think about it is that our biceps don't actually care what the DSM diagnosis is. <laughs> we're going to have the exact same benefits. And of course, the, the evidence there now is absolutely overwhelming. And one of our PhD students, Louise Kosnett, um, recently published a, a meta-review where we reviewed 33 individual systematic reviews and meta-analyses across a range of conditions, finding obviously a, a really significant effect of adding exercise to usual care. And I think one of the key points I really want to stress is that this is not a standalone treatment. We're not saying that exercise is a, is a magic bullet that's going to cure things but it is something that can work and can provide people with additional help. Um, it needs to be treated as an adjunct type of care. Now probably more exciting than treatment is the idea of prevention. I know Andrew Watkins is, is probably here, he'll be talking a lot about that in the next session. Um, but some work that, that, was, that was done on by, led by Andrew and Dr. Jackie Curtis, showing that if we actually intervene early at the point where, where someone's actually referred to a mental health service, and we provide adequate lifestyle interventions, we can prevent these poor physical health issues from, from happening. Now, we don't need to accept that that's just what's going to happen, and people are going to get, uh, are going to lose their, their physical health as part of the treatment of mental health issues. And then even more recently is this idea of prevention, and can exercise actually reduce the, the incidence of future depressive episodes? Um, and there's some really promising data, there were two papers out in the American Journal of Psychiatry this year, one enough that um, I was lucky to be involved with, led by Felipe Schuch, a colleague in Brazil, um, effectively showing that as little as 60 minutes of physical activity per week could prevent around 12 to 17 percent of instant cases of depression. And if we think about the, the, the significance of the public health burden of, of, of things like depression, the idea about just getting people into a little bit can have a really significant impact. That's probably one of the key points of what I want to mention today is that when it comes to exercise, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming, not just mental health but also physical health, that a little bit can actually go a really long way. Um, and where we stand to benefit the most is actually helping people who are least active, least likely to be physically active, actually engage in some level of activity. Yeah, it's not taking athletes who are already mentally active and getting them to do more, it's actually people who are doing absolutely nothing who are the least likely to have access to resources. That's where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck from a public health perspective, um, for both physical and mental health. Now, the evidence is so strong that recently there were guidelines released by the European Psychiatric Association, and this was led by a close colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Evan Stubbs. Um, and these were endorsed by the, the International Organization for Physical Therapists in Mental Health, um, and also the EPA. And that, that's a very um, up-to-date recent summary of all the evidence around uh, physical activity and, and serious mental illness. Now, we also know that the evidence has been cited in WHO guidelines, looking at the physical health um, of adults with severe mental disorders, lifestyle interventions recommended as first line treatment for weight management, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and also diabetes. Now, the, the media love talking about this stuff, and there's a few comments I want to make around the media code. So whenever there's something about exercise that the media really love talking about, there's two things I want to talk about. One is the social media comments. And I spent way too long on social media actually flipping through these. And I've got entire talks that I give mainly to, to students where I just use slides um, that I've taken from coverage. And the reason is, is because we always see the same comment. And those comments go along the lines of, exercise is great, but I can't get out of bed. So stop telling me to exercise. Um, and you can see there, new study finds people that are able to leave the house can manage to get dressed, manage to eat, find that exercise helps their depression. And I think it's really important that we actually take this on board. Um, and what this is telling us is that, again, it's not that we don't know how to address this. We absolutely do. We've got all the evidence there. It's not a gap in our knowledge. Um, it's been described as a failure of implementation, that we 
not providing these people with the right support, the right services to actually help people to get physically active and engage in healthy lifestyle behaviours. And that's a, uh, at a system level that we need to be actually providing these resources. Now, similarly, the media, the pictures they use, and this was some coverage we had in the New York Times um, on a paper again led by Felipe Shook, um, where we reviewed all the evidence around exercise and depression. And unfortunately, having pictures of, of sports models running into a new dorm again does very little to actually motivate the people that we're trying to reach. Um, in fact, it's entirely isolated. Um, and again, you can see the comments here. And this was actually just after Donald Trump got elected. I tried to avoid showing this in the US. Um, but again, that, that second comment, you know, a hormone is depression is to be unable to get up and go in the first place. Um, so while exercise is a wonderful antidote, it's difficult to implement. So again, we need to look at actually what do we need to change in order to help these people get moving. Um, and this is the last slide that I'll show up about social media. But we really have to be engaging in these people and these consumers and finding out what it is that we can do to actually help support them to get moving. Okay. When it comes to the, the, the evidence of research, and this diagram, some people might be familiar with, is this pipeline of research from, from efficacy through to, to implementation. And, and what it's really telling us is when we start with an idea, we're asking the question, can a program work? And this is the efficacy, efficacy level data. So we've absolutely got an overwhelming body of evidence saying, yes, exercise works. What we don't have and what we need to be focusing on is up here. So that the implementation but also effectiveness, which is asking the question, does a program work in the real world? And how can we adapt what we know works in those efficacy studies? How can we take the principles that we know work and actually apply it to our local context and to our, our local settings? And this brings me to, to the key point of the, the Lancet Commission that we made, um, which is around the diabetes prevention program. Now, a lot of people in, in working in mental health may not be familiar with the DPP, but this was a massive study of over 1,000 participants from the United States, published in 2002. Um, and that was a study, they had about 40% of people from an ethnically diverse background, and they were over 1,000 participants at high risk of, of diabetes. And they ran what they considered was the, the best practice, evidence-based lifestyle intervention that involved all of these components. And what they found was a 60% reduction in the incidence of diabetes. So in other words, this program is highly effective if it's implemented properly. Um, but unfortunately, when we look at the evidence around what we're doing for people living with mental illness and, and the interventions that we're providing, they're usually completely under-resourced and failed to meet the basic principles of what we know works in the general population. So coming back to the first slide about equality and, and equity, what we're doing is we're often providing interventions that we know have very little chance of being effective. Um, and then unfortunately, we conclude that they're not effective and we don't fund them appropriately. And in fact, we're actually just not adapting and tailoring these programs to what they should be. So when we look at the actual components, it often will scare people because it sounds highly expensive. Um, but what we, what we know is that if we can actually invest in these properly, we're actually likely to save a whole bunch of money in terms of the outcomes. But the things that we know work is having individual case managers, face-to-face -face contact, educational components with behaviour change techniques. We need to offer supervised, structured exercise. We can't just tell people, hey, go for a walk. We know it doesn't work in the general population, so we can't expect that to work. Um, maintenance sessions and it needs to be tailored as well. Now the, the DPP was um, endorsed by the American Medical Association, the Center for Disease Control and the US Preventative Task Force. And I won't talk through this, but effectively um, this is now being covered by a lot of insurance companies in the US. And in a system that's, that's difficult to navigate in terms of healthcare in the US, if that's already happening there, we need to look at what we're doing here, here in Australia. Now this slide, sorry this is actually a terrible slide, it's just a bunch of acronyms, but effectively what this is, at the top here is all the components of the diabetes prevention program. So there's key components that we know we need to be looking at. So including both diet and exercise, using specified behaviour and change techniques, having qualified staff, and this is a really important point, we, we know time and time again from the evidence that having practitioners with tertiary qualifications, so dietitians, exercise physiologists, that are trained um, in providing these interventions, we get a better outcome. We reduce dropout and we get better adherence, which is really not a surprise. Um, you know, the existing mental health workforce is already entirely overburdened. We can't just expect them to take this on without extra support. Um, we know that at least two supervised sessions per week is associated with a better outcome. We also need to train the staff. Um, we heard the Commission talk about culture eating strategy for breakfast, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as 
well, but it's really important that we actually train the existing workforce and bring them on board. Um, likewise, peer support, we know is a really important aspect. And what all these acronyms on the side are actually some of the biggest uh, interventions, the biggest trials that have been done looking at lifestyle interventions for people with mental illness. And unfortunately, if we look at the components of the benchmark against the DPP, none of these studies actually endorse every one of those qualities of the DPP. So again, they're under-resourced, they're not meeting those basic principles. Often they're pretty good at including both diet and exercise, um, but in terms of offering structured supervised exercise, we often are letting people down there. Um, training the mental health staff, also letting people down there as well. And IMPACT is a great example of that. This was a, a big trial in the UK, led by Fiona Cochran, where they actually tried to just train existing mental health professionals. Um, but they found that really they didn't work properly um, because they didn't provide enough time, they didn't have enough resources in order for that culture change within the services to, to really take place. So I want to switch a little bit to talk around exercise and, and something else about exercise in terms of sedentary behaviour and everyone that's sitting down is going to look a bit horrified in a second. So feel free to stand up at all the, the exercise conferences, we now have about a third of the room that is, is standing remotely. But this is um, one of my favourite studies in, in recent times, which is, is, is really simple, I'll talk you through it. It was basically a group of healthy young college men from the US. Um, so these were he healthy, active young men and they basically gave them all the pedometer, so a little computer clips on their belt to measure the step count. They then split them into two groups. Okay, so we'll say that the group on the left here, you were the control group. So the control group, they just gave you a pedometer and for one week said, do whatever you normally do. Now what happens when you give someone a pedometer for one week? <laughs> Typically, for about two or three days, they'll do a bit more exercise. And that's exactly what happened. So over that one week period, they did a little bit more exercise and they measured their depression scores. This is the blue line. So over that one week, they did a little bit more exercise and their depression scores dropped ever so slightly. Now the intervention group, I don't know how they got ethics approval for this because we wouldn't be allowed to do that here in Australia. They gave them a pedometer and said you're not allowed to do any exercise and keep your daily step count below 5,000 steps. So about half the public health recommendations. Um, and you can see very clearly what happened to their levels of depression over that one week period. And so for me, there's very clear evidence of, a, of almost a dose-response relationship between sedentary behaviour and our mental health. And the implications for mental health services, I think, are absolutely clear, which is we don't only need to be thinking about exercise, but actually what are patients, what are people doing all day, every day? I know the facilities that I've worked in, people are just sitting. And I think everyone's responsibility, every healthcare professional's responsibility, to actually look at reducing sedentary time, in addition to just promoting exercise and activity as well. Now when we look at sedentary behaviour, we know that people living with mental illness are far more likely to be sedentary compared to the general population. And there's lots of reasons for this, obviously the side effects of medication, uh, there's a range of factors, but we do know that they're far less likely to meet physical activity guidelines. What we also know is we've got mental health staff in there, and you're probably wondering why the hell are we measuring the sedentary behaviour of mental health staff, and it comes down to culture. And what we've done at, at South East Sydney Local Health District, and I want to talk a little bit about this work led by, by Dr. Jackie Curtis, that we call Keeping Our Staff in Mind. And this is on the back of some funding, some reoccurring funding to actually implement the Keeping the Body in Mind program for, for um, consumers in, in South East Sydney. And I think this picture sums it up quite nicely. The top-down approach, I've shared my vision, so now we have a shared vision. So we've said, right, exercise should be available, everyone's going to come on board, and that's not the way it actually works. And this was the original COSIN team. We had the idea that when we got this funding for these new clinicians, that instead of just dropping them into the mental health service, we actually needed to look at the culture of the mental health service first and actually bring the staff on board, upskill the staff to make sure they, they, they knew what we were actually trying to achieve and the potential benefits of that too. So what we actually did was we offered staff a four-week intervention, the exact same as what we offered patients. So they got access to, to exercise and diet interventions paid for by the service during staff time which sounds completely radical. Um, and what we were looking at was, was not only their attitudes, their confidence and their knowledge towards these metabolic interventions, but also their own willingness to refer their patients. And what we found was that even in a really short amount of time, we managed to actually reduce weight in our staff, despite that not being the main outcome, particularly among staff that were overweight or obese. Um, and this is currently under review at the moment. We also did some qualitative work where we showed the staff the, the positive impact that it had um, I can tell you one quick story. We had, I remember a, a, a male staff member, a nurse, who had been in the service for over 20 years. Um, and part of what we did was we provided staff with access to Fitbits as 
well. And he originally didn't want to be involved, he just said, look, this is my job. If I wanted to be a personal trainer, I would have studied <laughs> personal training. Um, so he was quite negative about it. But after a couple of weeks of seeing all the staff around him talking about their Fitbits and creating walking groups and a few other things, he came to us and asked if he could just have a Fitbit as well. Of course, that wasn't part of the study, but we, we gave him that Fitbit. Um, another four weeks later, he was coming into the dietitian and showing the dietitian what he was cooking for lunch. Um, and so that had a huge effect on, on, on his view, which obviously is going to impact how he treats his, the people he's working with and the impact that, that that's going to have. So we did reduce sedentary behaviour in, in staff by, by over an hour, which is absolutely clinically meaningful. And we can see here, I realised that COSI made me more aware of how sedentary I was, especially during working hours. And we also heard stories of staff talking about actually taking the, the people they were working with for a walk. So instead of just doing the talking therapy seated, it actually maybe going for a walk outside or seeing other ways, other creative ways that they can build activity into their day. Um, and 95% of them plan on paying more attention to increasing their activity levels. <coughs> now probably one of the most important findings for me um, was the, the exposure to exercise physiology and dietitians. Now at baseline we had 10% that had seen, said they had seen a dietitian before personally, and 7% that had seen an exercise physiologist. And of course, if we're asking practitioners to refer to someone they don't know what it is that they actually do, that's probably going to be problematic. Um, but at follow-up, 95 and 93% reported a better understanding of what it is that those practitioners actually do and what it is they have to offer as part of the, the multidisciplinary team. How are we doing time? Doing great. Excellent. All right. So again, coming back to the, the commissioner's comments around culture. Um, eating strategy for breakfast, I think it was. Um, so this photo is actually taken at the Royal College of Psychiatry Conference. Um, I think I first went to this conference maybe eight years ago, and I think I remember the looks on people's faces, and I told them I was an exercise physiologist, and I was like, what, what are you doing here? Um, so this was only two years ago in Adelaide, where if you imagine the trade area where all the drug companies have their stalls and getting away free coffee, we had two exercise bikes um, sponsored by Exercise Sports Science Australia and we were actually doing fitness testing on the delegates of the conference. Um, and the idea behind that was partly to, to generate discussion and talk about referral pathways and what it is that we do. But the other part was actually to collect data looking at the, the fitness levels and the physical activity levels of psychiatrists and how that relates to their prescribing habits given the importance of, of culture. We know that healthcare professionals who, who endorse healthy lifestyle behaviours are more likely recommended to their patients. So this, this is Hamish Tippins, who's one of our PhD students, um, and he's just written this paper, it's been published in the Journal of Mental Health, looking at the physical activity levels of the delegates of the psychiatrists. <laughs> um, now slightly worrying is that this was obviously a biased sample, because these were people that were willing to come and sit on an exercise bike during the lunch break in front of their colleagues. Even so, we had 60% failing to meet the physical activity guidelines, which is that double the Australian average. So we have this real issue where these healthcare professionals themselves aren't physically active. And again, these are the ones that probably were more likely to be active. They're also the ones where their consultants, the registrars whose consultants made them kind of sit on the bike as well. <laughs> <coughs> so a little bit about the sort of international context. And I think here in Australia, we are leading, leading the way in many respects, partly due to the healthcare system. Um, in terms of Medicare referrals and the ability to use existing infrastructure right now. So at the moment, people can be referred um, for up to five sessions to an exercise therapist and a dietitian, um, people living with, with, with chronic health conditions. And this is some, some international work. So these four organisations, Exercise Sports Science Australia, the American College of Sports Medicine, the British Association of Sport and Exercise Science, and Sport and Exercise Science New Zealand, collectively represent about 250,000 exercise professionals around the world. Um, they've come together to this, uh, and committed to this statement around trying to achieve a reduction in the life expectancy, a reduction in that gap by the Olympics in 2032. Now, of course, this is somewhat ridiculous. And if we actually wanted to achieve this, the very first thing we that is smoking. We know the statistics around smoking. Uh, there's a lot of people here that, that are experts in that area. But really what this is reflecting is the fact that we actually know how to do this. Um, it's really just about implementation. It's about these organisations are ready, we know, and they're already prioritising this and the commitment to try and address this going forward. And as part of that, we identified three things that we want to be looking at. Um, so knowledge, infrastructure, and culture. And what we're talking about there around knowledge is not just knowledge in exercise professionals and dietitians of mental health and psychopathology, but actually making sure that our colleagues within 
mental health and within general medicine are trained in, in dietetics and physical activity and how to work together as part of that multidisciplinary team. And we're doing a lot of work with um, uh, especially undergraduate medical students, um, undergraduate psychologists and also psychi psychiatric registrars to ensure that we can work together from, from the get-go to actually make this happen. Infrastructure is pretty self-explanatory. We do need some level of infrastructure. Um, we've had a lot of programs start purely by having uh, student exercise physiologists um, together with a nurse or an OT um, in one consult room in the elastic band, and then we've seen programs go from there in terms of building capacity through the student workforce and placements as well. That's a big potential going forward. And finally, the, the culture and actually making sure that the staff understand the importance of this. Now, one of the, the key points that I really want to stress here today is that we're not talking about weight loss. And one of the biggest issues that we have is this link between exercise and weight loss. So we, actually, exercise is highly ineffective for weight loss in the absence of dietary change. Weight loss should not be the primary reason why we're encouraging people to exercise. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that the chances of someone achieving significant weight loss in the general population, the chances of an obese man achieving a normal weight without surgery is about 1 in 210. Now, this isn't to say that it's not important, and of course weight is a risk factor we need to be addressing it, but it's not the primary issue why we should be exercising. And one of the biggest issues that we have is that when we ask people why they want to exercise, including people living with mental illness, the number one reason is weight loss. Now, if we know the odds, um, and that's the primary reason why people wanting to exercise, we're setting people up to fail entirely. And I saw this time and time again with people I would work with where we come, we go uh, through a program, they come back maybe a month later, they really motivated, telling me how good they're feeling, but they jump on the scale and the scales have actually gone up. And that can be hugely demotivating for people. We actually need to completely remove weight from the issue. It's not why we want people exercising. We want people exercising because of the mood benefits, because of the benefits to sleep, because of the physical health benefits, the social impact, of self-esteem, all the other benefits that we get that are independent to weight loss. So I think it's really important that we actually stress that. So what can we measure instead of weight? And one of the, the, the key issues is fitness. And fitness, we're talking about the body's ability to pump oxygen, and basically how, how a functional, someone's functional capacity. And we know that fitness is a strong predictor of mortality, a strong predictor of morbidity, and we also know that the modest increases in fitness are associated with significant reductions in, in risk of, of death. So modest as little as 3.5 mils per kilo per minute. And just keep that number in mind, because before I go on to that, this is some really recent data. This only came out a few weeks ago from the US. This is data from over 120,000 people in the general population. Um, and what it is, is looking at their fitness in relation to mortality. And what we can see very clearly is that the fitter you are, the longer you live. And what's even more important, I mentioned at the start, that this idea that actually where we stand to get the biggest benefit is actually taking people that are the most inactive, most deconditioned, getting them to do something. And you can see that very clearly here. So here we've got lower fitness, here we've got elite athletes. But when you get the biggest drop in the adjusted mortality rate is actually the people that are low to below average. So we're not trying to take people who are already above average or already fit and getting them a little bit fitter. It's taking the people that are really at the bottom of the spectrum in terms of fitness levels. They're the people who are least likely to access services, the least likely to be targeted. <clears throat> That's really where we need to be putting our resources and where we're likely to get the biggest impact. Now that number I mentioned before, about 3.5 mils per kilo, we asked the question a couple of years ago together with colleagues David Van Canford um, in some meta-analyses looking at can we improve fitness levels in people living with, with depression or with schizophrenia? And of course the answer is absolutely yes. It's an absolute no-brainer. Within a little bit of 12, with as little as 12 weeks, we can have a cl clinically significant impact on, on fitness levels. So I'm going to finish up shortly, but I'm just going to change tack a little bit to talk about something that I feel very passionate about. For me, I became really interested in resistance training when I was working at uh, St John of God Hospital in, in Australia. And I started there, I just realised 10 years ago, um, which is, is, is a bit terrifying. But my um, interest in resistance training came about from realising that when I was going to patients' rooms who were, who, who were you know, refusing to get out of bed, particularly people living with PTSD, if I went into their room and said, hey, let's go for a walk, they would often tell me to just bugger off out of the room. But if I went in with an elastic band and talked about strength training, you know, something that would take as little as, the, as one to two minutes, so maybe a couple of push-ups, a couple of bicep curls, something really simple, they were more likely to engage. And it was probably just so that I would leave them alone, but regardless, they would, they would actually give it a shot. So for me, it almost acted as like a gateway to actually getting people 
involved in, in other forms of exercise. Um, and we actually showed it was quite effective at uh, reducing anxiety, reducing depression, reducing symptoms of PTSD. Um, but also, more importantly, it acted um, uh, as a way of actually just building confidence within, within people. And so, this idea about resistance training in other violent populations and traumatized populations we've been exploring in places like Turkey with Syrian refugees. Uh, and these photos were taken with a workshop we ran with psychosocial workers in, in, in Turkey with the Syrian women using, using elastic bands as a, as a form of intervention. And we've got some ongoing work happening around this at the moment. And even more recently, um, we're doing some work in, in Bangladesh. Uh, and currently, this is the world's biggest refugee camp. This is a coup de Belong. A lot of people don't know about this, but there's over 900,000 uh, Burmese refugees that have fled across the border into the coup de Belong. Um, now, the peak of the crisis was in 2017, but there's actually been refugees living there um, since 1991. So some of the people that we're working with are nearly the exact same age as many that have been there their, their entire life. And what we're doing in Kupalong at the moment is working with local Rohingya um, to actually train them as sports therapists. So offer them employment, but also trying to encourage them to flip the model from sport for competition, which at the moment the only people that have access to sport are young, healthy men that can compete but actually trying to flip that to give access to the entire community and making sure that other people, other vulnerable members of the community living in the camp can get access to sport and sports-based interventions. So I'm about to wrap up. Two things I want to point out. One, this is a great um, campaign out of the UK called PNPJ PJ Paralysis, and PJ is referring to pyjamas, um, but it's the idea of getting patients out of bed. And this is not targeting mental health yet, but I don't know why not. And I think it's just calling out for someone to actually adapt this for for mental health settings. Um, similarly, there's a, a great online, massive open online course that's free around physical activity promotion. Um, this covers a lot of the guidelines linked to the, the, the recent World Health Organization strategy around physical activity. Um, a bit of a shameless plug here for a recent textbook that together with Brendan Stubbs we co edited. This is really targeting exercise professionals. Um, and we're hoping this sets the curriculum for, for exercise based training for physiotherapists and also exercise professionals going forward. I'm going to skip over um, this quite quickly. This, this was a questionnaire that we developed to, to measure physical activity. Um, because this issue around for practitioners not to underestimate how important it is that even if you're asking a question um, to patients around how much exercise you're doing, this can have a really significant effect. And the, the final slide is what, what can I take away from today? I've sort of broken this up and I've left out um, consumers here, which is on my behalf, but I think for clinicians and practitioners, can I just ask people that I'm working with you know, a simple question, how much exercise have you done, can you really significant, can I refer? For researchers looking at um, adapting and scaling interventions, working with implementation scientists, health, economic, health economists, that's really what we need and what's lacking in the evidence today, um, and then culture change for the, for, for the policy people. And so I'll leave it there, thank you.
like let's drop them if we don't have a lot of money or funding or resourcing. And yet I think they're basic to this kind of work. What do you think? Thanks for sharing that. I totally agree. I think the idea is that we need these programs to be integrated as part of usual care. It's not just an add-on. But too often, I think we people think about exercise and diet as something because we all sort of have to deal with it. But it's something that we also have the expertise in changing. But actually, it's really difficult to change. We need to support people. And I think on that note about the social benefits, whenever I talk to journalists, they just want to talk about endorphins. They're like, tell us about how good endorphins are. It's like, actually, no, you're giving you know, people structure. You're giving someone a reason to get out of bed, potentially. And that we can't underestimate how important that can be. And, and also how these interventions can be used to engage people with more traditional mental health services. Um, you know, if we think about you know, stigmatised populations, you may not want to come and talk to a psychologist or a mental health professional, like young men, for example. They're happy to come and lift weights. So why aren't we putting, uh, you know, we're putting gyms within mental health services, which is great, but why aren't we flipping the model and putting mental health professionals where these young men and these young people are, such as gyms? So I think there's a really underutilised opportunity there. To, to actually build on this and, and sort of stuff as well. We've got time for one last quick Thank you. Um, Indigo Dea from Vimiac. Um, thanks for your presentation. I was interested in um, what the research might tell us about um, if, there, if interventions around exercise and diet need to be done differently in response to um, medication side effects. And it, it, in my mind, it is. What do we do about the impact of sedation and movement disorders for exercise? And what do we do about um, the way that antipsychotics often um, make us want to eat every single thing we ever see? How do we manage our fitness and, and health? That's a really good point. There is lots of evidence now around that, lots of examples of good programs, but particularly the diet and stuff. I look at work by Scott Teasdale, so he, he's done some brilliant work looking at dietary interventions and is really leading the way in terms of that looking at cravings and hunger and all those sorts of things as well. So I would say, and the sedation effects as well, they're things that we can take into account but we can work around. So, so there are additional barriers, absolutely, but that's why people just need more support so that we can work around that. And also looking at you know, changing the goalposts, what we're trying to achieve from these interventions too. So you know, I, I see them as, as the, they're just additional barriers that we, that we can and we, we just need to jump over. I think uh, for me that was just uh, worked at so many different levels. I think it was fundamental, you know, one of the things that really hit me was the issue around weight loss. And we're putting expectations and backing our self-esteem, whose self-esteem is already vulnerable and it's astounding. But at so many levels, I think it's so so heartening to see the work that we're doing leading Australia and have Simon's uh, energy and commitment that the academic rigour and the connection I just think it's very exciting and, and really opportunity. Please take this opportunity to, to link. That's a whole part of it as well. But we can link with Simon and his team uh, into wherever you are in Australia. I know there was a few other questions and we'll provide opportunity to put out a, a, a blog so that that could be responded, raised and responded to so everyone can see that. So thank you, Simon. It was such a fantastic and, and stimulating uh, presentation. Would you all join with me in thanking Simon Rosenberg?